we're this we're gonna pick up on uh, reflexes. And so reflexes are these rapid, automatic, involuntary reactions of muscles, glands to some sort of stimulus, like if someone you hear a loud bang, right? You might have an involuntary reaction of muscles and glands to that loud bang noise. So uh, the stimulus is required to initiate a response. That's that's a characteristic of all reflexes used. You can't get a reflex without a stimulus. And all reflexes are a rapid response that require very few neurons. Typically, it can be it's going to be as little as two or more, but you can you only need at least two neurons for a reflex. Now, uh, it's all, also reflexes are a rapid response that occur the same way every single time, and it requires no intent or pre-awareness of the reflex. Like they just occur on their own. So reflexes can occur even if you're unconscious, right? You hear about people doing reflex tests to determine, you know, if someone's spinal cords are intact or if their brain stem's intact. Because reflexes don't require consciousness. They're just going to occur automatically. Now, um, the components of a typical reflex arc include uh, some neural wiring. And it always begins with, with some sort of receptor in the peripheral nervous system. So it's the receptor that picks up the stimulus, whether, whether it's like you know, pain, temperature, vibration, sound, sight. You know, any of these things could be, be picked up. And this information then uh, is sent along to the uh, central nervous system, like the brain or spinal cord. And from the brain or spinal cord, then we'll have uh, an efferent neuron that carries information out to some sort of peripheral effector, whether that's like a muscle or a gland of some sort. So what this slide shows then is a typical reflex arc. And we're seeing basically a sensory neuron from skin. It's going to pick up information from skin, carry that information back towards the spinal cord through your spinal nerve, through the dorsal root ganglia, through the dorsal root, to the dorsal horn where it synapses on an interneuron in the dorsal horn. So this interneuron can branch into several different branches. You might have a branch that goes up to your brain to bring conscious, conscious information to your brain. Uh, otherwise, the information get, can get sent towards a motor neuron in the ventral horn, and that motor neuron can send inf information out to a peripheral effector like your biceps muscle. And this is just a simple reflex. You know, like maybe someone pinches your shoulder, and that causes your biceps to contract. So that's a simple reflex arc. And you see in this arc, we got one sensory neuron, one interneuron, and one motor neuron. So it's only three neuron process for this reflex. And they could be they could be very simple, but they're rapid because there's not really much processing that occurs here. It's just information that's rapidly rapidly transmitted to your spinal cord, and then information that's rapidly transmitted out of your spinal cord to a peripheral effector. So they occur really quickly. In fact, we'll do some reflex tests in our sensory chapter later. Now, um, some reflexes can be ipsilateral or contralateral. Ipsilateral means a reflex occurs on the same side. So most reflexes that you guys have thought about are probably going to be the ipsilateral type. You know, like where if you, if you tap the patellar tendon and then the same leg kicks out, right? That would be an ipsilateral reflex, same side of the body. However, there are some contralateral reflexes too, where if one thing happens on one side of the body, it influences a, a response on the opposite side of the body. That's a contralateral reflex. An example of contralateral reflex would be like the withdrawal reflex, where if you step on a tack or something and it's painful, and you pick up your right leg, that reflex then causes the left leg muscles to contract in order to stabilize your body. That way, you can only can you know can stand on one foot. So that's a one, that's a form of reflex there. Now, um, reflexes can be monosynaptic or polysynaptic. If they're monosynaptic, all you have is, is a sensory neuron and a motor neuron because it's one synapse. You have a sensory neuron that's synapsing on a motor neuron, that's it. You have one synapse there. So a monosynaptic reflex there just involves one sensory, one motor neuron. Polysynaptic reflexes involve more complex pathways. They exhibit, they have multiple synapses that are involved in, you know, processing of information, and they involve interneurons within that reflex arc. So over here it shows a monosynaptic reflex. Over here we have a polysynaptic reflex. So with a monosynaptic reflex, this could be like your patellar tendon reflex, where you tap the patellar tendon, you get stretch within this tendon, which activates the stretch receptors in the muscle. That sends information back to your spinal cord, where then it synapses on a motor neuron and then causes the muscle to contract, which then causes your leg to kick out. Right? That's a monosynaptic reflex arc. And the purpose of this is actually to protect your muscle from too much stretch. Now, a polysynaptic reflex could be like the withdrawal reflex, where you have maybe some sort of painful stimulus, that pain information gets sent back to your spinal cord, synapses on an interneuron, that synapses on a motor neuron, and that causes you to withdraw from that painful stimulus. 
Now, because it's polysynaptic, it's going to take a little bit longer to respond because each step here takes time. Um, but that's an example of polysynaptic reflex. So are these ones ipsilateral or contralateral, you guys? So if you tap the patellar tendon and it causes your leg to kick out. Ipsilateral, right? Because it's the same leg that, that moved, that was tapped. How about if, you, if your hand's burning and then it causes your arm to lift up? Also ipsilateral, right? Because it was the same arm that lifted up. But there are contralateral reflexes as well. Now, uh, this withdrawal reflex is polysynaptic, like we just saw. So a painful stimulus can cause transmission of information to your spinal cord. Interneurons receive the information and cause a motor neuron to uh, send information out to a, an effector. And that effector then can help to uh, enact the response. So, um, oh darn, I, I thought I had a slide for the withdrawal reflex. I guess I don't. Now, um, what this is saying, you guys, is that although the withdrawal reflex involves ipsilateral pathway, right? Like, let's say if you step on a tack, right? It hurts. So then the reflex is you pick up the same leg to, to, to get your foot off that tack or Lego or whatever, you know? Um, that is ipsilateral, right? But there's another part of that reflex pathway because it is polysynaptic where neuron can actually communicate with another interneuron that then communicates with the other side of your body. So let's say if you, uh, with your right foot, you step on a Lego, and it causes your foot to lift up, right? Well, part of the reflex is actually to have left leg muscles to contract and stabilize your body. That way you don't just fall over where you lift your leg up. Okay? So um, there are aspects of the withdrawal reflex that are both ipsilateral and contralateral. Ipsilateral would be the leg moving up in response to the painful stimulus. Contralateral would be the opposite leg contracting to stabilize your, your posture, if that makes sense. Now... Um, we also have stretch reflexes, which are monosynaptic reflexes. Uh, this is where stretch in a muscle is monitored by stretch receptors called muscle spindle. And the purpose of this is that um, if muscle gets stretched too much, then our nervous system can be aware of that, right? Like if, you're, if, if muscle is being pulled on too much, uh, we actually have receptors for force in there. Now, uh, what we find then uh, are in the muscle itself, wrapped around the muscle fibers, we find these intrafusal muscle fibers, and uh, basically what they do is they measure the amount of stretch on these muscle fibers. So part of the stretch res uh, reflex there is it uh, when you tap the patellar tendon, you're basically pulling on these muscle fibers because the muscle is attached to the tendon. And when the muscle fibers get pulled upon, the stretch receptors sense, uh, they can kind of pick up that information, that information is sent to the spinal cord, and it causes a reflex, which is to have your leg kick out. But the reason why your leg kicks out is your muscle's contracting to counteract that stretch. You know, if the muscle's being pulled upon, if you contract, then you're doing the opposite of stretching, right? So it's actually a way to protect the muscle from overstretch is to induce it to contract. Now, um, we also have this thing called a Golgi tendon reflex. And what the Golgi tendon reflex does is it actually uh, measures the amount of tension at the muscle tendon junction. And uh, as muscle contracts, basically force is exerted along tendons, and it results in an increased tension that's actually sensed by this Golgi tendon organ. And what happens, you guys, is that actually this helps prevent damage to tendons. Muscles have the potential to pull or contract so strongly that they can actually rip tendons. But to prevent that ripping of tendons, this Golgi tendon reflex senses tension in a tendon. If tension becomes too high, it actually will cause inhibition of muscle contraction. This is also one of the things that uh, prevents us from being able to contract too strongly. You know, like part, part of, partly what your limit of strength is, is overcoming this reflex. The reflex prevents you from contracting your muscles too strongly and also prevents your, your uh, tendons from tearing. So uh, it's actually a nice way to protect your tendons from overstretch. So what we find that is that right at the muscle tendon junction, we find this Golgi tendon organ information about stretch is sent to the spinal cord, it actually inhibits the motor neurons that are involved with contraction, not excites them. But it's still considered a reflex because you're having some sort of response. But our response here is inhibition, not excitation. And by inhibiting the skeletal muscle from contracting, then you're preventing over-contraction and overstretch of the tendon. That way, this tendon doesn't tear. But tendons can tear, you guys. Like Sometimes you can use a muscle so strongly that a tendon rips. So you guys hear about like uh, people's patellar tendons ripping, you know, and sometimes they can tear with so much force, it sounds like a loud, like a loud bang or snap. 
Now, uh, what this slide shows you guys are just the different reflexes here that, that uh, you find throughout the body. So we have biceps reflex, triceps, abdominal, cremasteric, patellar, ankle, and plantar reflexes. And all of these reflex tests are used to determine spinal nerve function. So if someone's biceps reflex is uh, working, then that suggests that their spinal nerve C5 and C6 are working, or they're intact, right? Like the spinal nerves are, are intact and functioning. So the biceps tendon reflex is where you find the biceps tendon right here in the antecubit. You can tap that biceps tendon with a little reflex hammer, and their arm should kind of flex up a little bit. We can, we can test this later if you guys want to. Um, triceps reflex is back here, right by the right by the olecranon process. You guys have the triceps tendon there. If you tap that triceps tendon, it should extend out your arm. Okay, that's also another reflex test. But it tests for functions of C6 and C7. Uh, abdominal reflexes are basically where you, um, basically, if you stroke the abdominal muscles, like they should see them contract. But again, you can't do this to yourself because it's a reflex. Just like you can't tickle yourself, you know? Like someone else has to do this to you. <laughs> so someone has to briskly stroke your abdominal muscles to get your abdominal muscles to contract. If your abdominal muscles contract upon being briskly stroked, then that suggests that T8 through T12 spinal nerves are functioning properly. But some funny ones are like cremasteric reflex. He has the cremaster muscle you find in the scrotum. So the cremasteric reflex is where in males, if, if you briskly stroke the thigh of a male, their scrotum should contract and kind of recoil up towards the abdominal cavity. And it makes that noise. <laughs> True story, right guys? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so the cremasteric reflex tests for L1, L2 nerve function. So if you suspect that someone may have maybe have like nerve injury around L1, L2, easy way to test that if they're male is to stroke their thigh and their, their scrotum should contract up towards the abdominal area. So it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, patellar tendon reflex is test for L2 to L4 nerve function. This is a pretty classic one where they actually tap the patellar tendon and your leg kicks out. Right. Otherwise, there's other like other reflexes like the Achilles reflex that tests S1 and S2, or the plantar reflex where someone actually strokes the bottom of your foot and your toes should kind of fan out. Okay, um, and we call it Babinski's reflex. That's one so that goes away, it does, yeah, exactly. So um, it's kind of neat. it's kind of neat. The reflex is still there, but the reflex response is different between infants and adults. Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah, so why is it the patellar reflex doesn't always work? Um, you know, it could be just because they didn't hit the right spot, like they didn't hit the tendon. They might have missed the tendon. Uh, and, and also, you have to be com completely relaxed. If, you're, if your thigh muscles aren't relaxed and they're, they're kind of stuck in a contraction state because you're tense about maybe the reflex test, then your leg won't move in response to that reflex. So the only way to test these reflexes is that someone has to be completely relaxed, like resting muscle tone, kind of relaxed. Their leg has to be dangling freely, not in a contracted state. That's the only time it'll work. Otherwise, if you do a reflex and there's a delayed response, that may indicate nerve conduction problems. Like when, you, when someone has a disease of, let's say, the myelin sheath, and maybe action potentials don't travel as fast, you'll see that the, the you see delayed reaction times, like with people who have multiple sclerosis uh, or MS, you know, their patellar tendon reflex will be delayed. And it's visibly delayed. You can see that they'll, they'll tap the patellar tendon and it'll be a little longer before the leg kicks out. They'll still get the response, but it takes longer for the information to get there. Um, otherwise, if there's some nerve injury, you might see that there's absolutely no response. And that's why they're doing these tests is you're, you're looking for nerve function. So let's say if you did tap the patellar tendon in somebody and they didn't get a response, they may have nerve injury to L2, L4. So like, think lumbar plexus area. So, you know, it's, it's they, when I say may, it's, it's not, you know, there's other contraindications, but it could indicate nerve damage.